Muriel Rubini, welcome. Uh, great being with you today, Krishnan. Let me take you through some of the ideas in your book through the prism of our politics at the moment. You, you start with debt as one of the great crises. Mm -hmm. Now, what we are told about debt is that, yes, it's high, but we have a plan to bring it down over time so there's no problem. Why are the politics wrong? Well, the politics is wrong because uh, stocks of private and public debt, private being debt of households, corporates, and financial institutions, public is central and local governments, have been increasing decade after decade. As a share of GDP globally, that in the 70s was about 100% of GDP. By 1999, it was 200% of GDP. Last year, it was 350% of GDP and rising. In advanced economies, 420% of GDP and rising. In China, 330. So we have a mountain of debt and many institutions, some parts of the household sector, some parts of the business sector, some financial institutions, some governments, some entire countries are insolvent. Given their income, they're not going to be able to pay back their debts. I call them zombie institutions. Until recently, even those who had debt ratio that led to insolvency could survive because we had uh, very low interest rates. Today, unfortunately, we have the increase in inflation rates, double digital rate in the United Kingdom and Europe, and central banks have to fight inflation by increasing interest rates, short-term interest rates, and that leads also to increasing long-term interest rates. So mortgage rates are rising, credit card interest rates are rising, auto loans, student loans, business loans, and so on and so on. So those institutions that could barely refinance themselves now are facing massively increasingly debt servicing at a time where the economy is contracting, we're entering a recession, and we have inflation. So it's about a triple whammy. There are people who say um, this, is a, this is a con, that governments can just print money, cancel their debts effectively. Mm -hmm. why, why doesn't that work? So you are correct. In the UK, in US, in Europe, we're borrowing our own local currency. And if you had a bout of unexpected inflation, inflation can reduce the real value of nominal debt at fixed interest rates of long duration. But it's a tax. We're taxing creditors and savers to redistribute income and wealth to those who are borrowers and debtor. And is that a tax that actually is not even decided by a parliament or by a political government, but is decided by the central banks? So I do believe that actually, given the rise of debts, private and public, we are in what uh, economists call a debt trap. There is so much private and public debt that there'll be an incentive to try to wipe it out with a bout of unexpected inflation. We don't want to raise taxes enough. We don't want to cut spending enough. So we're going to use the inflation tax to resolve this problem. It's a form of default, however. It's a capital levy on savers and creditors and all who hold public and private debt. Again, the government, our politicians tell us that this is a period we will go through, that recession effectively will do the job. It will help bring inflation under control. People will take real terms pay cuts. They will have less disposable income to spend. Inflation will come down and we will resume normality. Your warning of a prolonged period of high inflation and stagnation. What, why? First of all, the increase of inflation we've had in advanced economies like the UK, Europe and US is driven in part by what people refer to as being bad policies loose monetary, fiscal, and credit easing during the COVID crisis, too much for too long. But then we also had a series of negative aggregate supply shocks that reduced growth and increased the cost of production. The first one was the impact of COVID on production of goods and services, on the supply of labor, and on global supply chains. The second one was the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on commodity prices, oil, natural gas, food, fertilizer, industrial metals. And three, the zero COVID policy of China has led to further global supply bottlenecks. So it's a combination of bad policy and bad luck. In the case of the UK, there was also a self-inflicted wound because the decision of Brexit reduces potential growth from about 2% to maybe one and a half. It increases the cost of production. We have less migration, 
you have frictions in international trade, and therefore it's also a stagflationary process. So on the supply side, we have these shocks, but over the medium term, there are the shocks that are medium term stagflationary. Deglobalization, reshoring of manufacturing to high cost countries, French shoring, aging of population, restriction to migration, decoupling between US and China, global climate change, pandemic, cyber warfare, weaponizing our currencies as a tools of national and foreign policy, a backlash against income and wealth inequality. These are all factors that are more medium term, they're all stagflationary, they reduce potential growth, they increase the cost of production on the supply side. On the demand side, central banks are saying we're gonna fight inflation at any cost, and we're gonna go back to 2%, in my view, they're not credible. They're gonna blink, they're gonna wimp out, because if they try to raise interest rates to fight inflation, not only they cause a hard landing, a recession, and it's not gonna be a short and shallow recession, it's gonna be a severe one, but then they have a crash of the stock market, a crash of the bond market with interest rates going much higher, a crash of credit markets with the interest rates on private loans rising significantly, and that economic and financial crisis is gonna be so damaging, they're gonna blink, they're gonna monetize deficits, and as I said, if you cannot raise taxes, cut spending, you have to use the inflation tax. So, so despite what the politicians say, you don't believe that they, or the central banks, are really prepared to do what's necessary? I don't think. We have so much debt that the only the path of least resistance essentially is monetizing and use the inflation tax. And by the way, today we're already a very large fiscal deficit and public debt. But in the next few years, we'll have to spend more on defense and national security because we have on one side the Russian bear who's a threat in Europe, but also the rise of China is gonna imply that NATO is gonna have to be towards Asia. So everybody's gonna spend more on national security and defense. We have the problem of global climate change. We'll have to spend a fortune to try to mitigate or adaptate to global climate change, that's another war. Uh, we'll have other pandemics, COVID-19 is not gonna be the last one, so either spend a fortune to prevent the next one or expose like we did this time around, we'll have to spend a huge amount of money to reduce the economic damage from the next pandemic. We also have a process through which automation, artificial intelligence, robotic is gonna lead to permanent technological unemployment. People are going to be displaced forever and will need to transfer money. People call it UBI, universal basic income, to those who are left behind. That's going to be expensive. And we're also going to have now a backlash against liberal democracy because there is rising income and wealth inequality. There is economic malaise. The middle class are squeezed. The poor are squeezed. And therefore, our fiscal policy will have to be pro-labor, pro-workers, pro-unemployed, pro-minorities. Otherwise, we're going to have severe social strife. I mean, how do you feel about being called Dr. Doom? Well, I, I usually say I'm not Dr. Doom. I'm Dr. Realist. But of course, it's not as catchy to be called Dr. Realist. There are some upside, there are some downside. Unfortunately, I feel that uh, for the last 20 years, we've been kicking the can down the road. We're putting our head heads under the sun like ostriches, were, and we're not addressing the fundamental threats, economic, monetary, financial, political, geopolitical, technological, environmental, and health. There are major threats that are all connected with each other, and it's a slow motion train wreck. When you say these things can be avoided, do, do you really mean that? Or, or, you know, or do you think that's just a theoretical thing? Because if you don't, don't believe that governments and bankers will do the right thing, you know, is there any reason to think that on any of those other threats, people are prepared to do what's necessary? Well, in each one of these chapters, 10 chapters, I talk about the threats and about possible solution to them. There is no free lunch. For any problem, you have to incur short-term cost to improve these threats over the medium long term. And the political economy of reforms and of pain is that very few people are willing as governments and countries and politicians to accept the short-term pain for the long-term benefit because those politicians are not going to be in power. So there is a bias about kicking the can down the road, unfortunately. And then I have two chapters, one about how 
there is all this confluence of risk that's going to lead to a dystopian future. And another one in which there is a less dystopian or more utopian future where step by step we implement the policies nationally and internationally and we have the right types of technological innovation to get us to a better future rather than a more disastrous future. So there is some hope, but there is no free lunch. On each one of these issues, there are constraints on doing the right thing. I mean, if you take climate change as the big yeah. global threat, yeah. what do you think the way the world currently tackles climate change tells us about the world's ability to tackle any of these mega threats? Well, unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, greenwashing. There's a lot of green wishing. There is green inflation because to produce uh, the green metals, you need a lot of fossil fuel energy that makes costly to produce electric vehicles, electric cars, and these green metals. A lot of these ESG, environmental, social and governance investment is just talk. You know, every corporation, every bank has a report on how to achieve net zero, but they are produced by their own uh, publicity and PR departments. There is not much substance to it. And think of it this way. Why is it so hard to deal with uh, global climate change? I think there are at least five types of constraints to doing the right thing. Number one, in many countries, take the United States where I'm coming from, half of the country doesn't believe in climate change or human-induced climate change. So when Republicans are in power, no policies to address it. Number two, there's a conflict between young and old. Older people are not going to be around where all the damage occurs. The young people are going to live for another, you know, several decades. Uh, the young don't tend to vote, the old tend to vote. The costs are in the short run, the benefits are in the long run. Internationally, there is what people call the free rider problem. If a country does all the effort to reduce their emission to zero, net zero, there's massive costs, but if nobody else does it, then the pollution is global, and therefore there is no benefit. And forcing 200 countries to agree to go to net zero is mission impossible. Problem number four is a conflict between advanced economies and emerging markets. We're telling China and India, cut your emission to zero like we want to do in the next 20 years. And they respond and say, you folks in the West, you created this problem, 200 years of industrialization, 90% of all greenhouse gas emissions stocks Historically, cumulative come from the West. Now you're telling me, stay poor, don't become rich, and cut my emission to zero when I'm still poor. No, I'm not going to do it. For the next 20 years, I'm going to increase my emission. When I'm richer, maybe I'm going to start to think about it, unless you bribe me, unless you give me subsidy. The subsidy needed to convince poor country to do the right thing are about a trillion dollars per year. What was agreed in Glasgow or Sharm el Sheikh is per change, 10, 20 billion dollars. No emerging market is going to do it. Final conflict is geopolitical. In the world of geopolitical conflict and rivalry, US and China don't agree on global security. They don't agree on pandemics. They don't agree on what to do with trade. They don't agree on what to do with financial stability. And they don't agree on climate change. Final point. My former colleague at Yale, Bill Nordhaus, got the Nobel Prize in economics a few years ago for his work on the environment. He says that to achieve the Paris target about increasing temperature not more than 1.5, the average global carbon tax should be $200 per ton. Today, what's the average globally? Is $2 per ton. In US, even less than that. In Europe, maybe five or six. Let me ask you, which government in the world is going to increase carbon tax from $2 to $200? A 100 times increase. No one is doing it. The contrary is happening. Now that the energy prices, gasoline, diesel, natural gas are sharply up because of what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, everybody is cutting fuel taxes and carbon taxes. So we're doing the opposite of what's necessary to induce people to move away from fossil fuels towards renewable. And, that, and that's why you say we're heading towards dystopia. But I mean, just on that, yeah. I mean, is there any way of tackling all of those things that doesn't involve massive costs to the developing world, a massive reduction in all of our standards of living. <clears throat> you know, because we're, we're told, oh, there's a virtual circle, virtuous circle you can create. You know, we can have big green economic growth and we can transfer assets to the developing world and we can solve all this problem. The given current technologies, uh, mitigation, that means going to net zero, 
is mission impossible. Uh, in 2020, we had the worst economic contraction in 60 years, and net greenhouse gas emission fell by 9%. 9% nothing. And now they're well above pre-COVID levels because economic growth is back. So mitigation implies that we current technology, we have to have native growth all over the world in poor and rich country forever, politically impossible. Adaptation means let temperature go to plus two, plus three, and then limit the damage and the cost coming from the rising temperature. It's gonna be massively, massively costly. So doing the right thing does involve us having less? Yeah. We would have to accept it, but we don't want to have less. We don't want to have negative economic growth. We don't want to have reduction in our per capita income. Now, there is hope that some technologies in the future are going to be able to resolve the issue of climate change. Frankly, I don't believe that it's going to be renewable because the share of renewable in global energy in the last 20 years has gone from 8% to 11%, while the share of fossil fuels has fallen from 82 to 80 rest of being a nuclear power. It's too, too, too little, uh, too slowly. It's not going to happen. Some people hope that, say, new technology like fusion can provide us with cheap energy, with zero greenhouse gas emissions, and that will be the real revolution. But we might be only 15 to 20 years away from commercial application of fusion. There have been some experiments recently suggesting that's possible. If it's 15 to 20 years from now, it's too late. If we could get that stuff 10 years from now, there is maybe hope that some technology resolve the problem. And probably, as I said, it's not going to be renewable. It's going to be some other types of technology like fusion. Is there any scenario in which there is both a happy ending and a happy journey getting there? For climate change or for these other threats? For any of them. Well, for each one of them, I think that the solution probably starts not with generic talk about leadership, national or international. That's uh, cheap talk. But uh, for the last few decades, technology has helped us to resolve many problems, increase the economic pie, increase potential growth and productivity growth. So the solution has to do with some miracle that leads to higher productivity growth. That we can't predict and can't know. At this well, point. you know, there, there is some optimism that AI, machine learning, robotic automation is going to increase the economic pie and it's going to lead to potential growth in advanced economies rather than being, say, 1%, 2% to be 5 6%. Now, if growth were to 6%, the pie is so big that uh, we can resolve the problems of that. We can maybe find solution to climate change, also to pandemic. The problems, however, are several. Problem number one, in the aggregate productivity number, we don't see yet the benefits of these technologies. Should happen, but maybe has not happened yet. Two, these technological innovations are capital intensive, skill buyers and labor saving. So if you own the machine or the capital owns the machine, you're going to be richer. If you are in the top 10% distribution of income, skills, education, human capital, probably the AI makes you smarter, more productive. But if you are a blue collar worker or a white collar worker in low value added, but even in medium value added industries and sectors, over time, your job and your income is gonna be made obsolete by the machine. Initially, routine jobs, they tend to be blue collar, but increasingly even cognitive jobs can be sliced in a series of tasks. And each one of these tasks can be automated and those jobs are gonna be a threat. And eventually right now, there are all these innovation like chat, GPT, they suggest that even creative stuff, writing a piece of music, a piece of art, even intelligent paper can be done increasingly by the machine. So even creative jobs over time might be threatened by technology. Final point about technology, we think of it as being bringing peace, prosperity and progress, but historically, technological innovations are done by government that want to build a bigger and more dangerous weapon to fight war for global domination. We had the first industrial revolution, we had the first era of globalization, and we built bigger weapons that led us to fight World War I. And then before World War II, again, we had another race to weapons that led us to uh, World War II. And at the end of World War II was what? Creating nuclear weapons that led to the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And eventually there were the civilian application like nuclear power and so on. And even today, the race between the West US and China on who's gonna be dominating AI, machine learning, 
uh, quantum computing, big data, IoT, 5G, 6G, and so on, is not only the reason who's going to be the dominant power in the various industries and businesses of the future, but who's going to dominate those technology is going to be also the global military superpower because the future of warfare is cyber, is drones, is autonomous weapons, is robo soldiers, and so on and so on. Do you think, given the scale of the tasks you are laying out, liberal democracy is able to deliver any of it? Do you, do you actually need authoritarian government to take the kinds of very painful, very difficult decisions that you're talking about? No, I don't think so. You know, I think it was Winston Churchill who said that uh, democracy is the worst political system apart from the alternative. If you look at autocracies and uh, non-democratic regime, many of them are corrupt and kleptocratic. The elites essentially steal the money for themselves and they make even more miserable the rest of the country. Two, even those that are, unquote, technocratic kind of authoritarian regime, there's way too much concentration of power. Look at China right now, where Xi Jinping is not just president, effectively is the emperor. And if there are only one person or few making decisions, they can make over time significant policy mistakes. And therefore, those authoritarian actually regime eventually lead also to economic misery and failure. So we, we need democracy, but we need the democracy that is probably reform, where there is inclusive growth, because the backlash against liberal democracy is coming from the fact that there is globalization, technological change, economic and financial power of the elites, and other factors are leading to greater income and wealth inequality. That's why people are going to populist parties of the extreme right or extreme left, or even established parties are becoming more radicalized. If you want to avoid that type of populism that leads then eventually to economic disaster, we need to have policies that are with growth that is sustainable, growth that is inclusive, growth that gives opportunity to everybody. Otherwise, there is going to be this backlash. So we have to do it in a democratic way. Autocracy is not going to provide those solutions. Can I just step out of this argument for a little bit to ask you about you? Yep. I mean, have, have you always been a sort of brutal realist in life, if you like, or a pessimist <clears throat> or a half-empty kind of child? Or, you know, wh where does your outlook come from, your <clears throat> approach? Uh, no, you know, if anything, actually, I, I think about when I was growing up between the Middle East and Europe, between the late 50s until the early 80s, when I moved to the US for grad school, you know, did at that time worry about, uh, say, war among global powers or about the nuclear winter? No, because after the detente between US and the Soviet Union and the Nixon going to China, the risk of war between US or the West and Soviet Union China went to zero. Did I worry about climate change? Never even heard about climate change. We're barely above Pindraster level. Global warming was only starting. Did I ever even think about global pandemics? The last one was 1918. We didn't have anyone until the 1980s. Did I worry about AI destroying most jobs? We're in the middle of AI winter, and there was some research, but zero application. They worry about trade wars and protectionism and currency wars and deglobalization, the opposite. There was GATT, WTO, and then Soviet Union collapsed. They joined the global labor supply, China, India, emerging market, with even hyper-globalization. They worry about populist threats to liberal democracy. You know, in most of the West, yeah, there were center-right, center-left parties, liberal democracies. They were not as polarized and divided as they are today. And authoritarian regimes were only in poor countries or, you know, Soviet Union and China, they were poor. They were not a threat. Uh, did I worry about major boom and bust of economic cycle or depression? No. Growth was stable. There was sometimes some mild recession. Did I worry about financial crisis? where the regulation supervision of the banks, capital controls, financial repression. They worry about high debts. No, they were low and growth was strong, so there were no debt crisis. They worry about implicit liability coming from unfunded pension and healthcare system, where the young and growing labor supply and workers, the elderly were in limited supply, and they were not this implicit unfunded liability. So we lived in a world that was complicated, it was not perfect, but between 1945 and the mid 80s, was a period of relative peace, progress, and prosperity. 
It's only in the last 20 years that all these things have emerged as being significant uh, mega threats. To me, the world today looks more like the period between 1914 and 1945, when we had the end of the first era of globalization with World War I, then we had the Spanish flu, then with the stock market crash of 1929, then with the Great Depression, then with trade wars and currency wars and financial crises, and we had uh, inflation, hyperinflation, deflation, then the rise of power of the Nazis in Germany, of the fascists in Italy, of Franco in Spain, of authoritarians in Japan, and then we ended up with World War II and with the Holocaust. And by the way, in that period of 30 years, some of the mega threats that are today risk did not even exist at that time. Uh, at that time, there was not the risk that AI would destroy jobs, right? There was no issue about uh, climate change. So is this something of a sort of a, a battle cry or a cri de coeur for you right now? Listen to me. This is really bad. It's not just another book. No, it's not. And it's not being pessimist. I'm not pessimist. I'm saying uh, in order to resolve the problem, first we need a reality check. These are severe threats. They're building up. They're all slow motion train wreck. And the time is to get a reality check and see whether we can do something about it. Otherwise, it's not just at the end of our global economy, could be the end of our planet, could be the end of our humanity. I mean, you have worked for the Clinton and Obama White Houses. Why are people not listening to you? It's very hard to make the tough choices. We always hope that the future is going to be like the recent past. We hope there is going to be some technology, a miracle. It's going to resolve the problem. Uh, everything implies cost in the short run and benefits in the long run when we, some of us are either dead or the politicians are not going to be in power. And the political economy of reforms and change is that uh, whether you're in a democracy or you're in autocracy, uh, you are not willing to make the sacrifices in the short run because you're discounting the future. You're giving more value to present consumption and spending and not enough to future and future generations. And therefore, we do policies that cause damage in the long run rather than resolving them in the short run for the benefit of future generations. It's a bias, a systematic bias. OK, well, let's for a moment assume that the dystopian vision is more likely than the utopian one. Um, and that you're right, people aren't prepared to take the tough decisions. How, how do we as individuals survive it? How do you plan to survive it with your own life planning, your own wealth planning? What do you, I mean, do you, how do you, you know, do you, do you put all your money into gold mm -hmm. or, or what? Well, there are many decisions that you have to do as an individual. The first one is how you prevent yourself from becoming obsolete, either because of AI or globalization or something else. So if you're a young man or woman going to university or college, I would say you need to understand technology because the future is in technology. So you have to have a major in something related to STEM. And probably you need a minor in liberal arts. You have to know how to read well, write well, think well in a critical way because you'll have to change jobs many times over your lifetimes. But you have to be well-rounded to be able to survive and thrive and prevent yourself from becoming obsolete uh, too soon. That's on the individual level. Then on the financial side of it, in my scenario, global equities are going to have a significant downturn. Even bonds are going to make you lose money because yields go higher and the price is falling. So you need to find financial investments that are a good hedge against inflation, the basement of fiat currency, political and geopolitical risk, and also environmental risk. So that's property? Uh, um... uh, a combination of, I would say, first of all, you need short-term bonds that reprice with higher interest rates. Today you can get 4 or 5% on a one-month treasury bill or gilt. That's already good enough. You want to have inflation index bonds that are going to do well when inflation is higher. Probably you want gold and precious metals and some of these green metals whose value is going to be higher when you have inflation, where you have climate change when there is debasement of fiat currency, if there is going to be geopolitical instability, the Chinese will have to dump dollars and go into gold that cannot be seized by the US or the West. And you need also real estate that usually tends to do well when inflation is higher because land and real estate, commercial, residential is in fixed supply. But with one caveat, in good parts of the world, lots of real estate assets are going to be stranded. 
sea rise level, hurricanes, typhoon, floods, wildfires, drought, you name it. So you have to invest into sustainable types of farmland, of commercial estate and residential, because there'll be lots of stranded assets also into real estate. And some combination of these assets create a portfolio that is a good hedge against inflation, against political and geopolitical risk, and environmental risks. What about things like cryptocurrencies? Well, I've been a huge skeptic of crypto. First of all, calling them currencies is a total misnomer. Uh, they're not a unit of account. They're not a scalable means of payment. They're not a stable store of value. They're not a single numerator. So anybody who knows anything about definition of money knows these are not currencies. Bitcoin has lost 80% of its value in the last 12 months. The other top 10 are lost between 80 and 90%. And about uh, out of 20,000 ICOs, initial coin offering, 80% of them were a scam and another 17% has gone down to zero. So out of 20,000 of them, 19,300 have also disappeared, literally. So it was a bubble. This is just a fad and has gone bust. And unfortunately, lots of people were young people, day traders were suckered into buying at the peak. A year ago, Bitcoin was 69, today's around 16, 17. And uh, those who bought at the peak, and they lost their shirts and their savings are now in big trouble. So I'm thinking about all the young people listening to this podcast who are thinking, so I'm a humanities graduate. Uh, I've studied um, English or history or, um, you know, a, an art subject. And, um, uh, but I'm thinking, you know, the future, there's a creative industry's future. You know, when, when, when traditional jobs go, all the future value will be in what we, you know, how we spend our creative time. Are they kidding themselves? First of all, even many of the creative jobs are subject to uh, technological obsolescence because now the AI can do some of this stuff. But even if you want to be in a creative industry, right now there are AIs that can help a musician to create a better music. There are AIs that they allow visual artists to create a better art. Uh, there are scripts of movies that are written in part by AI and then you can improve it and make it a little more sophisticated. You know, even financial journalism, uh, some basic stuff can be done by AI and then you can improve it. So knowing some technology is necessary. It's useful to know art, history, literature, and so on. It gives you ability to think, to write, to read well and think critically, but you need also some basic understanding of technology because technology is gonna drive everything, including the creative kind of professions. So you need to have some knowledge of technology. Otherwise, you'll become very fast, very obsolete. You, you mentioned universal income. I mean, do you believe that we're just gonna reach a point where there aren't enough things for people to do? Unfortunately, many jobs, routine, cognitive, even creative, are gonna be displaced by technology. The economic pie is gonna be bigger. So if we tax the winners and transfer money to other people, either by income or universal provision of public services for free, we're gonna avoid uh, social unrest. So part of the solution is uh, UBI. The problem with UBI is that people want the dignity of work. They don't want just a welfare check. They say, I want to be a productive member of society. If you're not, then it becomes a social problem over time. I mean, it's also about what people are happy to live on as well, isn't it? People want to aspire to a better standard of living. And if you're reliant on a universal basic income, How's your life ever going to get better? It's not going to better. Yeah, you're right. It's going to remain the basics to survive, but uh, you're not going to feel you're a productive member of society contributing, and therefore social and politically becomes uh, somehow untenable. It is sort of thinking about the right thing, doing the right thing, also really making us think about fulfillment, what we like, consumerism, the things we need, the things we spend our money on. Are we going to have to rethink all of that? We'll have partially to rethink. For example, with climate change, we don't have technology that allows us to deal with it without having lower or negative economic growth. And especially in countries that are already high income and high wealth, the question is whether more income is going to make you happy. And many things to do with happiness are totally uncorrelated. Above a certain level of per capita income, as long as you have food, shelter, and the basic needs of life, having more income and wealth doesn't necessarily make you happy. Do you so live I, like that? I mean, do you, do you live a simple life or a, yeah, a wealthy I, life? I, I live a life in which I have a home, 
I don't have a car. I don't even have a bicycle. I use city bike in New York to go around. I don't have a boat. I don't have a plane. Uh, you know, I don't buy fancy stuff. So, you know, I have a nice home. But I think that, you know, uh, as I said, the best things in life are priceless. You cannot buy friendship, love, happiness, community, compassion, care. And we have to maybe change our values and realize that maybe giving to others makes us more happy than having more material things for ourselves. If we accept that, maybe we'll accept even no economic growth and we can deal with. There is so much pollution created by waste and each of us individually should do sacrifices to reduce our carbon footprint. If we don't, we're doomed. Well, what do you think about this whole idea of no economic growth? You know, you know the idea that we, we worship the idea of growth and actually growth is environmentally unsustainable mm -hmm. and that we should be thinking about redistributing what we have rather than growing it? Well, I think that's a potentially valid idea. In advance, economies already reached their levels of per capita income. Probably we'll have to accept that growth is going to be much lower, and then we have to find ways of increasing the quality of economic activity rather than the quantity of it. But if you are a poor country or even a middle-income country, you will not reach the levels of welfare that you get in advanced economy, Telling them don't grow anymore is not politically accepted, not in China, not in India, not in Asia, not in Africa, not in Latin America. But in advanced economies, we have to rethink well, what's, what's valuable, the quality of life or the quantity of goods and services we have. Can I just ask you a little bit about this year? This year for many of us has seemed especially chaotic and blundering politically. Has, that, has it seemed that way to you? Yes, uh, this is the year where there's a return of inflation like we have not seen since the 70s. There's a risk of a hard landing starting in the UK. In Europe, it's going to happen in the US. Uh, you lost money on public equities, but you lost money also on safe bonds. Uh, there is a geopolitical depression and these tensions are rising. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty. We live in a period of, I would say, unprecedented, unusual, and unexpected uncertainty for use, and it makes people nervous. Can you give me the prescription then? I mean, on the, on the opening cover, the, the, the front, you know, the, 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 the fold, it does promise us um, that we can, uh, we can avoid it if we come to our senses and act now. <clears throat> what, what is the simple prescription then for what we need to do? Well, there is not a simple prescription. In each one of the chapters, I suggest a solution to each one of these mega threats. And I point out there are solutions, but they imply short term costs to the benefit of the common good over time. So the question is, are we willing to make those sacrifices? There are solutions. And in chapter 12, I describe a more utopian or less dystopian future where things slowly, slowly improve. It's going to be still a complicated world is going to be still conflicted. It's not going to be utopia, but we're not going to go to a dystopian economic and political and geopolitical and environmental collapse. That will be already good news, continuing relative peace, prosperity and progress. We need to have uh, good policies nationally, internationally. We need to cooperate domestically and reduce our divisions and cooperate internationally. We need strong leaders, both in the private and public sector. We need also the right type of technology that resolve the problems of climate change, of pandemic, of economic growth, of social political instability, and so on. And there, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not the one of the incoming train wreck, as long as we do the right thing. But the, doing the right thing means to be initially aware of the risk and the threats, recognize them rather than pretend they don't exist, and then figure out how we can individually and collectively do the right thing. Just finally, can I ask you, do you have children or grandchildren? Uh, no, I don't have any children, no. For those who do, do you think there's a hopeful future? I'm still an optimist. I, you know, I believe in, uh, as they say, optimism of hope and pessimism of reason. And being pessimist about what uh, can happen maybe gets the hope to start to do the kind of right thing. But I do worry about people who have children and grandchildren because their future is much more threatened than the one of their parents and their grandparents. Uh, there is still hope. And I think that maybe as we face this crisis suddenly, People are going to realize we have to start to do the right thing. So if you could change the world in one way, how would you change it? 
I would say that I would invest as much as I could uh, in the technology that can resolve uh, some of these problems. Maybe there is a future where climate change uh, can be dealt with uh, technological innovation. Certainly in the case of COVID-19, AI and new technology allowed us to create a vaccine uh, very fast. Uh, if we have uh, innovation, probably the economic pie grows much faster <coughs> and we can reduce problems of insolvency and debt and redistribute the income to those who are left behind. So, so we need to really invest even more than the past in the right types of technologies. Nouriel Roubini, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me here today.